Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to SOAS. Um, it's great to see you. Uh, my name is Casper Melville. I am a senior lecturer in the School of Arts at SOAS, and I'm also the director of the Festival of Ideas, of which this is the launch night, the opening night. So thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to you in the room, and also those of you who are watching us on the live stream or watching it recorded or whatever, you're almost welcome. Uh, just a little word about the Festival of Ideas. We did a little booklet. There's some of these out in the lobby, although we've got rid of most of them. Uh, designed by my very talented student, Natasha, who's sitting just there in the blue. Brilliant work, Natasha. The Festival of Ideas is a SOAS festival. I was lucky enough to be given the job to direct it this year, so I decided to put together loads of events of the kind that I would like to go to and invite the people that I knew and really liked or didn't know yet but wanted to get to know, and that's what's happening. There's 12 different events in addition to this one running for the next month. We've got a DJ panel, we've got a panel on dance, the importance of dance, we've got a panel on decolonizing music education, we've got various workshops, we've got a live podcast. Uh, students who did my podcast in class last year made a brilliant podcast, so I asked them to do another episode, some of whom are in the room as we speak, so that'll be brilliant, all about diasporic music in London. So the theme of the, of the uh, festival is thinking through music, so we're thinking about music, but we're also using music as a way to think and thinking about how music and dance, uh, you know, can open up different ways of thinking about the world. I'm delighted uh, to have a wonderful group of people to talk about jazz and jam sessions, not only jazz, but jam sessions and improvisation. So th the format of tonight's uh, event, which is called Steam Down Times So As, this is not a jam session, and we'll get to why this is not a jam session in a minute, will be we're going to talk for about 45 minutes and have a discussion about jam sessions historically and now and what it might be like to be in a jam session uh, and why uh, and, and improvisation. Then we'll have a break. I will encourage you to go and get some of the wonderful food that we've got, uh, which is provided by Made Up Kitchen, this great Hackney initiative out there in the lobby, and also get yourself a drink. And then, and you're welcome to bring that food and drink back into here. Uh, please respect the carpets, you know, throw out your trash. There are some bins out there, but you're welcome to, you know, settle down, bring food and drink in here. Then there'll be music, which will be run by uh, Wayne Francis and Nancy, who I'll introduce you to in a second, um, which will involve both members of the Steam Down Collective from Deptford, uh, part of the exciting new British jazz scene, alongside SOAS musicians playing a range of instruments, uh, some, some of which are the instruments that we teach at SOAS from Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, like the Kora, the Tabla. Uh, we've got voice, we've got bass guitar, we've got all kinds of things. It's an experiment. It's never happened before. We'll be making and bringing music to you that no one has ever heard before, which I can't tell you how excited I am about that as well. So settle in. Um, this is the talking bit. And, you know, we're at a university and it's one of the things we still value is talking and ideas and argument alongside music and dance and all that good stuff. So let me introduce you to my wonderful panel. Sitting immediately on my left is Emma Warren, my good friend Emma. Uh, some of you already know Emma is a, is a writer. Like me, she kind of started out as a music journalist um, and has gone on to become a kind of mentor and a teacher and, a, and an author, has written two brilliant books very pertinent to this panel, one about the Total Refreshment Centre and one about Steam Down, funnily enough. So um, welcome, Emma. It's great to see you. On Emma's left is Wayne Francis, who performs as Anansi, the, Anansi, the leader, the, the kind of prime mover behind Steam Down, which by now has really established itself as one of the most important collectives in British jazz and jazz-inflected music. Uh, he's a uh, He's a teacher, he's a brilliant musician. You'll see his work tonight, and, but we're gonna hear from him talking about his, his uh, experience with jam sessions and not jam sessions in just a second. And then on his left, we've got someone who I've wanted to meet for a long time, and I took the opportunity to invite Kevin Legendre. He's a British journalist, uh, specializing in writing about jazz and British black music. He's the author of a really good book called Don't Stop the Carnival, which is a history of black music in Britain. The one I've read is only volume one, and I'm told that volume two is under construction almost as we speak. We're taking a bit of time out <laughs> from your writing schedule for now, so thank you for that. Well, it's a jam session, so it's okay. Well, exactly, exactly. So please welcome my panel. Um, 
just before I, I, a bit of housekeeping, if there's a fire alarm, which I very much hope there isn't, leave by that entrance and walk up the stairs, don't take the lift. The toilets are at the very end of the foyer down there. We're going to be here in this building until 11. The music will stop sometime just after 10, but there's some time for kind of conviviality and to finish all the drinks at the bar and finish the food and not be rushed out of the building, okay? But we do need to be out of the building by 11 o'clock, okay? So let me start with this idea of a jam session. Kevin, I'm going to come to you because, you know, just to give a sort of context, what, what are we talking about when we talk about a jam session? And what, what's the role of jam sessions been in jazz historically? I suppose the easiest way to understand it is to say that it's a combination of formality and informality. That you have a structure, a designated space, an idea, uh, a date, a meeting, call it what you will, where people come together. But there's no express idea of exactly what's going to happen. So the spontaneity, the sense of possibility, the sense of people doing something that they haven't done before in terms of making music, the very real possibility of musicians who haven't met before meeting and creating something, again, which hasn't been uh, prescribed in any way, it hasn't been planned out in advance. I think all of that is kind of encoded in the word or the expression jam session. This idea of, okay, We've got a space, it might be a club, or it might be outside of a club. It might be, uh, it might be on the street, it might be in a park, it might be in a completely informal, non-artistic space, but we can use that to pool our artistic ideas, artistic energies and resources to create something really incredible. So if, you, if you're looking specifically throughout history, you'll see that it became a kind of a, ironically, a sort of formal product to actually have a record called a jam session featuring so-and-so. Um, probably one of the most famous is Sonny Rollins and Coleman Hawkins on stage together at one of these big festivals, maybe Newport, I can't remember exactly, but the idea of saying, right, okay, a jam session is something that can be marketed to the general public because we know what it is. And, especially if you have titans of the music coming together, two really renowned saxophonists, or two really renowned pianists, or two great guitarists, or a bunch of musicians coming together and saying, right, okay, let's see what happens. And there are varying degrees of formality. It could be somebody calling a tune, here's a standard, everybody knows, um, now's the time, or everybody knows body and soul, or whatever it may be. Let's see what happens when we play that in the moment. So I think um, in terms of jazz, it's, it's really, really important to give people an, uh, the opportunity to express themselves and to maybe do something that they didn't think they were going to do before. Possibility. Um, and it goes far beyond jazz. I mean, we can maybe talk about that yeah, a bit more. Not, That's a really it's, important it's thing. It's, That's it's right. not confined to jazz. It runs throughout black music, and, it, and it, it kind of spills over into popular music as well. I can give you some specific examples if, if you want a bit Yeah, later. we've got the hip-hop cypher and other yeah. things like that. But let's just stick on this issue of the kind of... Um, I mean, historically, one of the things about jazz, taking jazz as an example, uh, there was a time when jazz was really the shorthand way of describing all popular music, I mean, in, in the 1920s or 1930s. And Eric, Eric Hobsbawm, in the book that he wrote, he, he was a jazz critic uh, uh, for the New Statesman, and he wrote under the name Francis Weston, but he wrote this book, I think, in 1959 called The Jazz Scene, which is an interesting historical document, but he talks about jam sessions as being a place which, where musicians were freed up from what they felt was an onerous... Uh, task of just reproducing the dance music of the day. So they're all working musicians working in bands, you know, for dances or, or, you know, in big concerts. And then the jam session was a place where they could be freed from that kind of market uh, responsibility. Yeah. Well, the key term there would be after hours. Yeah. So you've done your hours either in the studio or on the road, and you've spent God knows how many days reading charts or being in a studio doing a particular session under the direction of a producer or an arranger or whoever it might be. 
And then when you get to a club, you have typically a smaller club. That's the thing. A smaller, you know, much, much more down at heel venue. You have the opportunity to blow. That's the thing. And I think for big band era musicians, swing musicians of the 20s and 30s, that was really, really vital in terms of keeping their sanity together to a certain extent and also having the opportunity to develop new music because the very, very obvious historical example which comes out of that is Minton's Playhouse, which in the is 40s largely... In New York. Yeah, which is largely perceived to be the place where bebop is created because musicians had the chance goes back to what I was saying before, to experiment, do something spontaneous, work out new chord voicings, work out new melodies, work out new rhythms, and have other players coming into the pool. I mean, the other thing which is, I think, related to that, which we probably don't take into account when we're thinking about the jam session, is the kind of intellectual jam session that takes place in musicians' flats as well in their personal living spaces where they come together and this goes back to bebop as well and they work out ideas too theoretically what happens if you voice this chord a particular way what happens if you look at this harmony and this is without needing to sell it to a producer Absolutely or putting not. it on a record or yeah. thinking about the you know will it sell or anything like that so there's an element of and this is the... this is outside of a performance space this, this is famously Gil Evans' flat in New York with Miles Davis and other luminaries around him saying, OK, well, you're looking at these intervals. How can we use this to get away from the format that's already become commonplace within big band music and swing? We need to create something else. And then when people like Thelonious Monk come into the picture, you've got Minton's, etc., it's that, it's that blend of... I suppose I want to put the, the the emphasis on people using their minds as well as just playing as well. Yeah. So there's so there's a there's a kind of an academic thing. Yeah, but it's, it's almost too. a school or a university yeah. type feel to it uh, informally. Let, let's just think about what it might be like. Wayne, we're sitting in a room here with with young musicians who are, you know, just about to join in a, a jam session. What's it like? Tell us about what it was like for you. I mean, have you, did you do this when you were a young musician? What, what was it? What was, do you remember the first one? Do you remember how you felt? Mm. What was the vibe like? I've been to quite a few jam sessions in my time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to quite a few. Um, first one that I went to was in a place called Iron Bar that doesn't exist in Labrador Grove. I was quite young, or at least the first one that I can remember. And... Actually, I'm going to go back. First one was in school, actually, like the not one, the first informal one. And it's when I first started learning how to perform and play music. There were a bunch of, you know, other younger people around my age. And they would just, you know, get together after school and just play just because. And that's when I kind of got introduced to improvisation. And it was through that space. So I think for me, that improvisation space is what made me fall in love with music, essentially. And so a jam session is very, very much relates back to my earliest kind of memories of wanting to, having a desire to do music. And I think it's the freedom of being able to create without a script um, that got me. I was just like, You're, you can make it up. You're allowed to make it up. You're allowed to make it up. I, but more than that, it was, I could connect with music more that way because I, I could connect what I was feeling and articulate that. And there's a process of learning how to do that, which is a separate thing, but having the ability to speak, which I think is what improvisation is, having, having your own conversation with other musicians simultaneously. Whereas I think when you read off of a chart, you're essentially reading somebody else's book. You know, and you're trying to interpret it as or somebody else's script. You know, like a translation, rather than a look like a script. I would say yeah. it's the same way it had to. But is know. there a difference? The way you mention it at school, I'm imagining perhaps people who are on the same level, parallel. Um, you know, experimenting mm -hmm. together. But then sometimes a jam session is a place where you know there are more established musicians and less established musicians. There's a kind of hierarchy that you're expected mm -hmm. to go and. Have you been involved in those kind of things? Yes, I have. What I will say is, when I was at school, we were not on equal levels. As in, the piano player that essentially opened up jazz for me was like 15 years old and could play Giant Steps. I kid you not, which if anybody knows about jazz, like Giant Steps is very hard to play. Um, 
And I was like, okay. And I remember just liking it. I was like, what are you playing? He was like, oh, I'm playing Giant Steps. I was like, I was like how are you doing this? And I didn't know, I, have, I had no idea because I didn't know anything about music theory at that point in time. But I have been to jam sessions where there's been a hierarchy. Um, and I see it on two levels as being positive and negative. Negative is, I think, you can constantly have this inner pressure to be good enough, you know? Or your ego can take control and you can be like, well, I need to play all of this stuff to fit in or... I need to play all of this stuff to be the best person there and it can get quite competitive. On the other hand, you could argue that competition stretches people um, if it's done in a healthy way. On, but I, I, again, negative side of it can be putting down other musicians that are coming up in the wrong environment. Um, I think there's many different sides of it. Um, I think the, the, the last positive is actually um, if, you, if musicians want to play with musicians of a similar level um, and it's about them stretching themselves sometimes that hierarchy keeps that main keep allows you to maintain that space I don't think it's done in the most productive way though I think musicians can get better at communicating it and be like keep on practicing and come back next time rather than like your graph <laughs> like I think I think that needs to change there's a um, kind of way to do it I'm there's sure a better way of doing yeah. it rather than it being and we'll get back to that when we talk about the naming of this event actually um, Emma Tell us about, I mean, I think of you as a kind of poet of space, but your, your work is so, is, is so poetic and potent and powerful about the kinds of spaces that jams can happen. And tell us, tell us a bit about that in relation to, you know, London, if you want to, or, you know, the, the work that you've, you've, you've written in quite detail about the kinds of spaces. What is it, what kinds of spaces do this sort of things happen in and why do they matter? Okay, well, I think that the jams form part of a substructure which are really important in the ecosystem of the music and the culture and the way that everybody experiences it, the, the people we call musician and the people we call audience. Um, but they're kind of hidden because it's, it's a little bit out of view. But I agree with both of you, hugely important. I should also say I only know what I know. I'm, I'm no expert in the broader subject of jazz. Um, but having been involved in what's been happening in London with, you know, musicians who are trained in jazz, but who also bring other forms of music culture into it, I, I, can, I can speak about that. And I suppose the first thing really is just to recognise the generosity of people who make the jams happen. Um, it seems to be mostly musicians who will make it happen, who just decide, OK, I need somewhere for us to do our thing, whoever their us is. And, you know, musicians are, it's a hard life anyway. They're working hard to make their music. You know, rent is so high, particularly for the musicians that are younger now are struggling with like a whole myriad of different issues that weren't present previously. And so I have a great deal of respect for the musicians who make it their business to make space and to bring together their fellow musicians and to set an intention that works for them and their community. You know, I saw that very clearly at Steam Down, the way that, when you came in, there would be um, things that people knew immediately without never having been there. Don't be a statue. You know, you were encouraging people to move. If you're going to talk, if you want to talk, and everyone, thank you, yes, yes. Thank you. Go outside. So there was a kind of clarity about what you were entering, and you were inviting people in on your terms, and you were telling people what your terms were. And so I, I really recognize the generosity. Um, and when I was thinking about the kind of jams that exist at the moment, I was thinking, oh, this is so London. There are jams which have very specific intentions. There's Higher Ground, run by two women. Um, there is Tom They Them's at Cypher Jam. For people who are trans or non-binary or genderqueer, um, there's a whole range of other jams that are happening. You know, Imaginary Millions, Ori Jam, um, the Steam Down things that are still happening. Um, plenty of other things which cater to a certain amount of people. And I, I think it's just really heartening that these are happening on lots of different levels for people with very little expertise, but plenty of ideas. Um, and, and some areas which are intergen intergenerational as well. So I think it's really good for like, sometimes to have things just for a community of interest or a community of experience. But I think it's also really good to have, as you're saying, and as you're describing as well in the histories of jazz, to have places where people can share expertise as well. And the jam strikes me as a, 
a good place for that to happen. Thank you. Um, Kevin, what's a cutting contest? I've, I've heard about it in relation to jams, but I've never been quite sure. What, what do they mean when they say a cutting contest? It's basically one musician against another to see who can cut the other one, who can play better, who can, I suppose, very importantly, gain the approval of the crowd as well and fellow musicians. So when you have two musicians coming up against each other, maybe in a jam with, with a, a rhythm section, and if you cut the other musician, then you basically get the better of them because you played a better solo. It's almost like you get a higher response on the clapometer. Um, but it's, it's that idea of competition, pure and simple. And it, it, it's something which, as I say, it runs right through black diasporan culture. It's very, very prevalent in blues. Who's going to get up and cut another musician? And it obviously goes into the freestyle and the battle in hip hop as well. Um, and historically, I mean, it, it's an interesting thing because typically when we talk about cutting contests, it always seems to come down to saxophonists. Yeah, it's, it's Lester one, Young. It's, there you go, Lester Coleman Young Hawkins. against Coleman yeah. Hawkins yeah. or Rollins and Train or, you it's know, it's like standard tropes. <laughs> but do we, okay, do we have any Betty Carter fans in the audience? Do you guys know who Betty Carter was? Yeah, yeah? an amazing jazz singer. So Betty Carter, and this is very important, was one of the few vocalists and one of the few female musicians who could cut a male musician. She could get up on stage and battle with a saxophonist. And just by using this incredible scat technique that she had, she could cut a, a, a male musician. So it was quite a macho uh, competitive. For the most, oh, oh it's, it's, it could be, it's purely comp competition. Yeah. It is about. And it could be a little bit vicious. Uh, it's last man standing. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like Even you, if that was a woman. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it was Betty, yeah. Or, yeah, if you're going up against Betty, then, you know, it's going to be last yeah. woman standing. But, um, but yeah, if you, if you take on another musician in the heat of the moment, it's a battle. Yeah. Wayne, let me, let me ask you about the difference in some ways between the kind of jam sessions we've just been talking about and the kind of things that you're doing now. It strikes me that in that older model, um, people are drawing from standards. They're drawing from a format. Um, they'll, they'll call a tune. I mean, how, the, the sociologist Howard Becker, who's a jazz pianist, wrote a book called Do You Know, which is all about the hidden knowledge that jazz musicians carry around and how that is deployed in any given situation. But... You know, I was at Steam Down not so long ago, and you weren't, there weren't stand, you weren't playing standards. There wasn't this sense of people coming in and joining in on the basic head and then improvising. It was something quite different. Is, is there something different going on in this new flowering of, let's call it UK jazz, although it mixes so many other kinds of music? Is that deliberate? And is that different from, you know, the standard jam session that we've just been talking about? Well, many layers to that question. Yes. One, I would say, what we do at SD Weekly taps into the wider diaspora of music, of, of Afro music, I would say. And I think that is pretty unique to London because, you know, within the project, like Loren sitting up there is like from Uganda, Shantae is from Jamaica, um, et cetera, et cetera. We have like, you know, Afronaut Zui is like from Nigeria and we will actively like tap into those spaces and those cultural references which is something that afro-americans didn't have that was something that they were cut off from through um slavery at that point in time we have <laughs> the privilege as kind of like migrants and first generation in in britain to draw from that culture as well as kind of tap into what's happening here so i would say that it it as a musician it makes me think about how do I explore all of those spaces? Because some of those spaces are what I would have heard, like music that my parent was playing, parents were playing, or I'll be going out hanging out with my friends and I'll be hearing this music and all of these different spaces um, that would have influenced me as a musician that weren't solely within jazz. And I think the, the space with SD Weekly is all about opening up, being open to all of those spaces. And, and I think jazz for me personally was always about the freedom of expression, as I said before. So the space is set up to allow those different threads to find a space to, to marry, essentially, musically. Um, that's, that's, that's... Is it the case then that 
that the musicians that are involving themselves in what you're doing, they're not carrying around a series of kind of models derived just from a jazz training or jazz standards, but there are a set of kind of understandings about where the music might go, which have been patterned by what's happened before or the kind of music that they know. Yes, I would say a lot of it comes down to lived experience. So I would argue that any person that's lived in London that probably lives in South East London, has been around like Peckham and they'd like walk down the road and be like, okay, cool. I heard Fuji music when I went to get my vegetables, then I heard Afrobeat. And uh, then there's like the going across the Caribbean spot, they're always like like blazing out like Bashment or or dub or something. So it's very easy for those musical influences to to be around anybody that walks around these spaces. So it's very it's quite natural to explore all of those spaces. I would say it, I probably would say it's more natural to do that than to stay within the solely within the jazz tradition, which is something which is more taught and learned and becomes part in, of either a professional practice or an educational practice. In what you learn at u university, yeah. In our current time, definitely, I would say that's where it's placed. That's where I learned a lot of you know jazz formally. But I would say with the generations before, they learned it from the record. There wasn't any sort of formal training. So when I speak to some of the musicians that are, you know twenty, thirty years my senior. They're like, well, we learned this from records. Mm. We would like have a record play and we'd wear out the record. Like, I need to get another vinyl because I listened to this so many times to transcribe the solo, right? So, and I don't think that changes. I think you've done that as well without a vinyls. Without so, vinyls, yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. wear out an MP3 or a, or a stream. Well, I don't know. Well, the button might just be like, <laughs> okay, I need to get a new MP3 player, but other story. Emma, on, on the spaces where these things happen, I mean, there's, there's something temporary and vulnerable about these spaces, but which appears to be part of their character as well, that in a way there's a tension between wanting them not to be commodified. You know, you don't want a club which is called, you know, the Jam Central and, you know, on the one hand. On the other hand, they really are vulnerable to gentrification, noise abatement and those kind of things. How, how do you think about that? What, how does, what do we need? In order I mean, to all jam? space is vulnerable, isn't it? It's not just these like temporary ones. Everywhere is vulnerable. Everywhere seems to be steamrolled. And I actually feel very strongly that we need better language to talk about um, what I would call antisocial neighbours. How is it possible that one person in one flat has more of a right to dictate the sonic environment than 300 people in a room or 20 people in a room. Why is one more important than the, the mass? And I feel like we need better language. Um, we need to be able to call neighbours antisocial because complaining about music is literally the most antisocial thing you can do. As bows for neighbours. I also think we need, but it's true. Like, we don't think about them like that. But Especially when wrong. they moved into the area next door to the place. Exactly. That's why they came. And um, it's definitely not, it, it's not just about space, it's also about control and power. So I went to Detroit, a city which is still semi-derelict in many ways, and they have a problem with neighbours complaining about noise. Much of the city is still empty, and yet people still move next to places where there is music, where there is culture, where people are having joyful experiences, and they complain about it. So I feel like we need to kind of turn our attention towards those people and stop them feeling like they can. Um, and also, like, why is there not an equation of, like, do you not need five neighbours to complain before you go down and shut down the sound? Why is it just one? I, I find it very, very hard to understand how we've got into this situation. And I feel like we need to do a bit of rethinking about it. So, yes, the places are under threat. Can I add something to that? I mean, that's, that's a really interesting point. It's just, it's brought to mind an incident that occurred probably about seven or eight years ago, maybe longer, I can't remember, but it was um, in Notting Hill. It was one of the small parks near the carnival route. I, ca I can't remember exactly what the space was, but it was, it was very important because a late great black British musician called Ray Carlos, who, who died a few months ago, sadly, saxophonist. So he was playing with a group of Rasta drummers and they were making a really beautiful noise. It was, it was just perfect. And some neighbors complained and the police arrived within maybe half an hour or something like that and shut them down. And I was observing the whole thing and I thought to myself, the rank hypocrisy of this situation is really quite amazing to think that 
This is part and parcel of what Notting Hill as an area is. If you take the culture out of Notting Hill, it ceases to be Notting Hill. But most importantly, especially for me as somebody of West Indian heritage, that's really our history which is being shut down at that moment, at that point in time. And I just thought to myself, well, this was the scene of race riots in the 50s because it wasn't safe for black people to be in the streets. And now, decades later, when black people are in the streets making music, it's still not safe for them to be there. So I think the political ramifications of that are really serious, and it shows essentially that even at this point in time where we're supposedly more advanced, there's still a gross misunderstanding of what culture is and how it underpins a community. And the value for it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it underpins, you know, the life which is, has, has led to Notting Hill being an attractive place to be. And but... yet, a few months after that, they were saying, Europe's biggest street party yeah. brings in yeah. so many millions to, the, to this country in yeah. terms of... Yeah. So, what do you want? You want the economic benefits of culture, yeah. yet you won't recognize the humanity of culture and you won't allow the humanity that underpins culture to survive. Yeah, absolutely. And it reminds me that there are elements in a way that this has become automated even. I was interviewing Lloyd Coxon about sound systems and he was saying, I mean, traditionally sound, sound systems had trouble finding places to play, but one of the places they could play were municipal buildings, town halls, church halls. And he told me they'd been put, putting these noise limiters on the walls which cut off the power once it goes above a certain decibels. And there's no one there explaining that actually, this may go high in volume. Because it's meant to. <laughs> because it's meant to, but it's a beautiful sound. And it's yeah. the sound of the city. It's, how, it's the heartbeat of the city. Wayne, it strikes me that comparative to the cutting contest and the, the slightly macho elements which were there in the old school, you know, amongst professional working musicians, you know, hard scrabble life, whatever. That doesn't seem to be the character of what I've seen of the London jazz scene. I mean, just one example, I, I go sometimes to Straight Pocket, which is at Brixton Jam, which is a jam session. You know, it's, it's very diverse. You know, there are younger players coming in trying to play. And, and each time I've been there, Sheila Morris Gray has been there, the, the great trumpet player who played, is in Kokoroko, and she's got an established career. But she's so kind and careful about how she interacts in that space that she doesn't play that much in, in, in many ways because she's, she's, she's generous. She doesn't want to cut anyone. She wants to leave space open for some of the younger musicians to step in. So there seems to be a real sense of kindness and care and Steam Down very much has got that as well. Is that, how has that come about? And is that, is that true? Is that a, a mischaracterization of, of... No, I think that definitely does exist now. I, I call myself a middle child within this continuum because I, when I first started going to jam sessions, there was a lot of like the cutting and all of this kind of stuff. And then I kind of saw a generation that was like just under me, um, like a couple years difference. And it was just a different kind of attitude that came around. And I think um, from what I gather, a lot of that comes down to tomorrow's warriors and the space just being like, come and play, come and play, keep on coming to play. And in a time where it's, you know, and a saxophone is not a cheap instrument, you know, I was working with a saxophone player the other day. He was like, oh, yeah, the saxophone I'm using came from, like, Gary. Uh, Gary runs Tomorrow's Warriors. So it's like, if, if so few of us have access to, you know, instruments or have, you know, the privilege to be able to play live instruments, which isn't that easy, really, in our city, it's way easier for me to be like, yeah, I'm going to go and like logic and like produce some beats and, you know, like write some bars or whatever. That's So to do this side of things, I think it needs encouragement for their four live instruments to kind of survive in a real cultural way for the city, for the musicians, for the artists. And I think that encouragement actually aids that. And I think a lot of those musicians are like, well, if nobody encouraged me, I might not be doing this anymore. I think, I, think really I mean, we need to take a moment just to acknowledge Tomorrow's Warriors. Many of you will know Tomorrow's Warriors, some of you don't. An incredible uh, Gary Crosby and Janine Irons. For 30 years, they've been running this organization, which has been dedicated to diversifying jazz, to giving people who wouldn't otherwise get a chance to get access to instruments or really high quality training with a pretty simple idea in a way. Don't charge for lessons. Free, free lessons. You've got to practice. They're quite, you know, the teachers can be quite 
intimidating. I've understood sometimes. Or you've got to put the work in, but all welcome. And they've created this kind of extended web of family because it's hard to find. I mean, I found myself writing an article about UK jazz and having named all of the people I thought were really hot in it, I then realized every single one of them had been through the Tomorrow's Warriors training program at some point, many of whom, like yourself, go back and give back as teachers, right? So there's a kind of self-replicating. It's like a university, but a university of yeah, in characterized football. by love. Yeah, exactly. It's very caring and generous for the culture. And it's something that's needed, really, I would say, having that space. Um, I myself actually didn't go through it. I just ended up teaching um, there. Okay. And I was, I, that's what my kind of personal contribution was to the space. But I've always seen what it's done, you know, and that was for me the reason why I wanted to teach there when Gary asked. He was like, oh, yeah, can you do this? I was like, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, please. I just want to, you were talking about um, Straight Pocket mm. at Pure Vinyl in Brixton. And I just want to make the point that Claudia Wilson, who runs Pure Vinyl, um, did a very generous thing because she recognized that there were some of the younger musicians who just weren't feeling confident to join the jam. So she made a junior jam. Um, so Straight Pocket was happening on a Monday. And then on Fridays, she'd just invite the younger ones to come in and just like a pre-jam jam. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that she gave her space and pushed, the, pushed everything to the side and just made it happen in an extremely understated way. And, and that is extremely encouraging. And when I think about the word encourage, I think about the fact that it contains the word courage. You know, these are strong things to do. It's not just encouragement isn't just like a gentle thing. It's a very strong, very powerful thing that requires the courage which sits, which sits in the middle of the world. And I think Claudia just has that in like, you know, endless amounts of that. What can we do to, to maintain this, what's going on? How can we support it? What do we need? How can we lobby? What do we, how can we get across the point that Kevin was making about, you know, recognizing the value of culture, which is a key question, isn't it? Well, I think um, slightly before the answer, I would just say I value these places as places for listening. Um, for active listening, for the, the kind of the human right of listening to each other and creating environments where musicians can listen to each other and where audiences, you know, the people we call audience, can listen. And listening is such an important skill. And so, again, I think that's another aspect of why these places are really valuable. They're kind of incubators for listening and for kind of um, enculturation so that you can kind of, uh, yeah, it's schooling in many ways. How do we protect them? Well, first of all, like we're extremely grateful to the people that do it, because I think even just telling them we're grateful might help them continue for a bit longer. Um, one of the things that I've, my work is about is about documenting culture. So I think telling the stories of this space can help us advocate for them to say that they're precious and important and that has, that has been turned into a story that can also help people advocate for their spaces and to keep going. Um, and I suppose there is also a place for hope, isn't there? Um, and for, so. for hope and for just doing it and for supporting with the money that we can, if we can, these places and environments as well. Kevin, looking at it kind of uh, with a big picture, it, it feels to me, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know, you and I perhaps of a similar generation, that there was a shift that happened in the... 2010s maybe i'm not quite sure i started seeing it even before i went to clubs or anything i noticed more people walking around london with instruments and there seemed to be this re i don't know if we call it a return obviously london in the 50s 60s 70s was a much more lively live music before disc culture took off is that a, is that does that ring true to you more or less yeah i think the um the rise particularly within black popular culture or return of instrumentalists and people who are able to bridge the gap between, let's say, hip-hop culture, beat-making, and live playing. It's hugely, hugely important. So suppose the influence of somebody like Robert Glasper, you know, is, who can speak to all these different generations, and he's playing the piano, and he's a, he's a badass improviser. Yeah. You know, something like that. I remember that being very impactful. But I think... I mean, it's Tomorrow's Warriors, again, to a large extent, like hammering home that message for decades about the importance of playing an instrument and also conveying the 
the huge cultural currency of that as well. It's not just about playing the instrument, it's also about upholding this legacy, which goes all the way back to the Caribbean. You know, when you think about these second, third generation Black Britons, saxophonists, horn players, pianists, or whatever, they're in the lineage of the Scatolites. They're in the lineage of Ernest Ranglin. They're in the lineage of Monty Alexander. Or, but there's an element, you know, an interesting element of discipline in that as well, isn't it? Because a lot of them came through Alpha School. They were yeah. drilled. They had to that's, work hard. They the had to thing, practice. That's the thing that runs all the way through. It's, you know, as McCoy Tyner said, it's as serious as your life. If you're if you're playing this music, then you're making a commitment. And the key thing is to is to hammer that message home. Once people understand that, then I think you really are making a difference. And one of the things which I really appreciate and is so different and interesting about going to these sessions, like going to Steam Down, is that this relationship between the players and the audience is different because the audience is often made up of, men, of musicians as well, that it feels like a space of sharing and not as judgment or of commodification. You know, like I've bought, paid my ticket and I want to be entertained. There is, you know, it's like, I always, it's almost like going... Uh, get to drama school and you're going to see a production of one of your friends and there's a sense of, uh, you know, uh, that wanting it to succeed. Wayne, um, I, I kind of wanted to give you the last word on this because when we were planning this event, I remember saying, you know, let's do a jam session and we've now got an event called This Is Not A Jam Session. And instead, you wanted me to, you wanted to call it a collective spontaneous improvisation, CSI, in fact. <laughs> um, just so we're just about to hear. Is, the, is there the, a crime that's going to be committed? Is that what you're I saying? I hope not. I not hope not that, crimes against music. I would hope not. No, but just just give me your. You know, you've just ha met met musicians, some for the first time. You had a little talk with them. What are you going to do, which which sort of articulates this? Not as a jam session per se. We're not not going to come and play autumn leaves or or you know jazz standards. What are you going to do? here on this stage in a few minutes we're going to trust the process <laughs> we really are just going to trust the process i think every person has something to say and something that they want to say we do it in words mostly and if you're a musician you can do it through sound and i think sound is the most direct connection to your emotions in the sense that you can articulate what you're feeling right in that moment. And then on top of that, you bounce the feelings, the energy field across the musicians on stage and to the audience and back around. And it creates this, um, I think this deep, profound connection that we all exist, that we all live, and we get to share a moment, an, a moment of feeling where we all kind of feel the same thing all together. And that's essentially what I always look for in a space with music is how do we find that space we all feel together? And that means everybody on the stage needs to be open to expressing themselves and find a way to, to speak together. And that can take a while um, um, sometimes, but I think you have to trust that process and you'll get there. That's it. So we're going to trust the process. Um, those of you who are sitting in here, you will be able to shortly Go in there, get some food, get yourself a drink, bring it back here, settle in. Musicians, be ready. Those of you who are watching this at home, go and make yourself a cup of tea or something, uh, will be uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then the music will start. I would like you to join me in thanking my wonderful panel, Emma Warren, Wayne Francis, Kevin Legendre. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Casper. Thank you.
Thank you. 
Yeah, this is more like it. This is what I wanted to hear when I said eyes the first time. So you're going to try it one more time. Eyes. Yeah. Where are we at now, Shantae? It's like a 6.2, do you know what I'm saying? That's, that's good. It's good. That's it's good. Improvement. Yeah, for this time, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick on people on the stage right now. That's what I'm going to do. And they may not like me for it, but they will like me when we get into the music. Is that right, Shantae? Yeah. All right, I'm picking on two people, Shantae and Lorenz. <laughs> Shantae, you got to start too, because I know Lorenz will catch in. Okay. You ready for it, yeah? I'm going to have to be. Yeah, yeah, all right, let's do it. <laughs> My, my back, you just out the door. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this is every Wednesday as well, you know. It's actually not. Um. Cause I know your love fills this place No, I'm not afraid to be alone Cause I know I'm not on my own I'm not afraid to share I know that you always care Your 
turning my darkness to light And I'm not afraid to do wrong Cause I know in your eyes that I'm
how are we feeling, everybody? Yes. I'm going to introduce everybody on the stage really quickly. We've got Nate Ricketts on drums. Just behind this mirror, we have Ernesto. And as I just said, here you have Liz Mira Zerfa in the center, right at the front. Renel Shaw on the bass. Just in front of him, her name is Shantae, her name is Shantae, her name is Shantae. <laughs> at the back, to the left of Renel, Harry on the flute. And to his left, on trombone, Viva. At the front, we have Kajali on Kora. And in the corner, is he going to do it today? Lorenz from the ends. All right. Um, Gaspar, do, how much time do we have? I think we're like at time. I don't know if we started late or not. Keep it going, Kajali. Yeah, more time, no time. We got some more time? 10 minutes? OK, good. Um, there's a guitarist. And so us. I can't remember your name. I need a, wanted somebody to come and join us. Yes, coming through. And maybe we swap out drummers. All right, cool, cool. Did you tell them what your name was? Oh, I haven't told them my name yet. I feel like we should. You, you can introduce me. Go on, I, I'll take it. <laughs> so, your host, saxophonist with the mustophonist. I don't know how you make that sound. <laughs> Is our leader, Anansi, Anansi, Anansi. <laughs> and I think we've got a uh, oud player, percussionist also. Come join us, man. And vocals. Volume down, keep it going though. Bring the volume down a bit. This mirror, I have a question for you. What's the what's the, what's this make you think of? Remember these days when we were on tour, and you uh, you tell me stories about Venezuela, and you tell me stories about your dad. What does this feel like right now? What does this feel like? The music right now. It feels good. It feels powerful. It feels transforming. Uh -huh. Across the sea, across 
across the lake, oh, across the sea, oh, across the lake. Oh, love is everywhere. Oh, love is everywhere. I said, oh, love is everywhere.
bring the tabla player up. Jumbo in and flute. Two, three.
para la India, María Laya. Si no por conocer, hay conocer a la India, María Laya.
Oye, supiera lo lindo que es el amor. Si María la ya supiera, oye, supiera lo lindo que es el amor. Yo ya lo hubiera entregado, hay entregado alma, vida y corazón. Yo ya lo hubiera entregado, hay entregado alma, vida y corazón. Yo había perdido la fe. Bendito Dios de que pudiera encontrarla Yo había perdido la fe Bendito Dios de que pudiera encontrarla Pero me dieron razón Anda razón que la había visto engachado Pero me dieron razón Anda razón que la había visto engachado Ya no. Um, we got another bass player in the house, right? Yes? Yeah, yeah, come through, come through. Nice, nice. Anybody else that um anybody else that wants to play that hasn't played yet? You want to play? Come through. Yes, yes. Kazali, come and join us, please. Lorenz as well. Actually, any um, keyboard players? Yeah, come through. Yes. All right, make some noise, make some noise. Yeah. All right, all good. So, everybody on stage, I'm going to do this out to the audience so you come into the process. We are going to start with just percussion, and then everybody else, I will cue you in later. Actually, we, we, we might have to pass some stuff down.
Okay. Grant, you here? All right, cool. Um, I need some some delays on 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 this one and this one. Yes. Okay, we we're, we're going. All right, so rhythm section. Anybody that's got percussion, we're about to start now. Drums.
made of so many levels of abstraction. You and me and everything has multiple levels of abstraction. Dimensions, rotation, eternal multicolor equation. Multiple dimensions. So.
multiple dimensions. Eternal multicolor equation. Rotation. Okay, Lorenz, you ready to come back on? Come and join us. Lorenz from the end. Anybody else um, that... Oh, where's the Umbreda player? Yes, come through, please. Yes. Cool, cool, cool. We're going to do a quick change. Make some noise for the musicians up on the stage, please. Any percussionists? Yes? Come through. Yeah, yeah? You wanna play some bass? Come through, Cassius. Jorge, yes. Where is he? Where is he? He's coming up, yes. You wanna come and play some congas, Jorge? Yeah, yeah? Cool, cool, good, good. Make some noise, come on, make some noise. Okay, let's um, can we swap the ukulele and um, and better, please? Thank you very much. Well, good. Make some noise. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Okay. Um, Ricketts. Yes, please. Give me some hip hop, please, Ricketts. You ready for it? Yeah. Yes, let's go. 
What do you need? Oh, the crap stack. Yeah. No, you're not getting it today. It's okay. <laughs> Cassius, I've got to call you on you next. And not get tempted by the fame I'ma keep a long distance from the demons in the shade uh, I'ma jump out every hurdle that be in my way I know it's long distance, no it's not a race Don't forget the mission Achieve a lot, I'm in them by a place I've been down a couple times, I didn't tie my lace But I had an ace on my sleeve I changed my location and this is what I seen I was building my foundation, I was growing out my roots I was fighting temptation and I stepped into the booth Sometimes it's hard, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I look around at my surroundings and I doubt myself. Am I gifted? Am I even working hard enough? I'm running up these hills while these dons are strolling in the park. And no comparisons, a thief of joy. So I try not to look at others, but it's hard, boy. It's like everyone gets their shot and I get beat. This couple of circulating circus hit these words to hit me. Nothing comes as tight as a fish. Too many people be you giving props that they aren't you. When I'm looking at myself, that's one thing you were you. Humble yourself and give them songs that only you can breathe. Then God reminds me that nobody was me anything. I, I owe it all to him, man, that's gospel. No one goes with him, that that's gospel. Sometimes I feel like throw one in the towel, but then I could be on my shoulder to remind me. Yeah, 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 About me. I'm a legend and make and I can say that so proud of you. I was lost till the music found me. I'ma have all the big labels wanna scout me. If you're talking down on me, they move around me. I don't ever wanna see your face again. I don't change for no one. No, I do not make amends. Never in a thousand years, but I pretend I won't say the shit again. How you supposed to stand out if you blend with the crowd? I'm trying to do my family proud and I will say that shit loud. Uh, balance is the key, I'll get it tattered on me. How does that stand? I didn't stand from in for a pound. Till I drop dead, I'll still be making this bread. I won't stop right till there's a break in the lead. Get love, give love, I know you heard what I said. This shit works both ways, man, it's deeper than... About it. All the tears and perseverance, yeah, he's heard about it. So you've been here and tell him what you're gonna do about it. So then I'm not gonna hide him, I'm gonna be about it. I've been inside myself asking for help because no woman is an island and I cannot do it by myself. I've learned to depend upon the one that God sent. And some more time on his presence and some more time will spend. It's time to make room, so no room forever, whatever. I don't really care because I am clever. I have bars that will take you to the separate Yeah, we flow around, man, we can be rock steady like. I'm a girl from the island, born in the ends. Moment to the friend. I take you to the top again. Hey, jumping, we're jumping on the drums again.
Yeah. Come on, now. sing it then. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sing, 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 sing it then. Yeah, 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 yeah,
Arena, arena, 
Give back, 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 give back,